Welcome to John Gets Games. This is the fourth and final bonus top 10 video that is being created to help support and draw attention to the John Goes Pro Patreon pledge drive that has been happening throughout the month of February 2018. Now, you may or may not know that I've recently turned John Gets Games into a professional endeavor, and that means I've been pouring a ton more time into making these videos uh, at the start of the year, and in order to make this financially make sense, the support of all you viewers out there is really necessary. So, if you are interested in directly supporting the channel, please check out patreon.com slash Games and take a look and see if any of the uh, pledge levels make sense to you. All right, so let's now get into the top 10 list itself. And this week I'm covering what I think are 10 of the best gateway games that are out there. Um, I do like these games as well, but I've tried to organize them based on just how well I think they do at actually introducing people into the hobby and specifically um, trying to imagine what it would be like to be somebody who is not familiar with games to sit down and play these games and try and consider the um, depth of the gameplay versus the actual rules length and all that kind of stuff. So this is absolutely a very subjective list, but uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Coming in at number 10, we have Dimension, which came out in 2014, and the idea of this game is really simple. Each player has a little uh, board in front of themselves with a variety of little holes in it and a bunch of these colored large spheres, and every single round you're going to flip up six rules in the middle of the table, and everybody needs to simultaneously try and build a little three-dimensional uh, pyramid out of uh, these balls that try to match all of those rules. And the uh, rules to the actual game itself are incredibly simple. And then the actual game is just six of these rounds, and each round only takes one minute each. So uh, when you account for the maybe downtime in the middle as you score these things, this overall game can take like maybe 15 minutes. And I love the, uh, the kind of thoughts and things that go into actually processing how you're going to put these balls out because the rules are relatively simple. They might say uh, you need to make sure that nothing is ever on top of an orange ball. And it might also say you must always have more green balls than black balls. And you don't need to use all of the balls out into the middle of your area. You just need to use the correct number of them. And then on top of that, if you're able to build a structure that matches all all of those goals, that's fine, but you're also going to get these little bonus tokens if you can do all six of those um, rules and then also make sure you use at least one of each of the colors because oftentimes it's easy to solve a rule. Like if it says you need more white than black, if you just don't use any black, then by definition, even one white ball in the middle is going to satisfy that. So I love the fact that there are kind of these uh, couple different tiers of difficulty and I like how easy you're able to jump into this game and um, just kind of fall into the rules and the puzzles and all that kind of stuff that's happening. And since it is real time and only takes a minute, that means that I guess if a player is just really not into this game, they're going to figure it out very quickly. And the overall experience is not very long. But what I've found is that people really do dig this one. And I have quite enjoyed this one as well. Uh, I, of course, met this one when I was significantly into my board gaming career already. So uh, I have to imagine what it'd be like to be coming into this new. And I do think that it's possible it might feel a little bit stressful for uh, people coming into uh, board games to try and and uh, try this experience out. But at the same time, it's a very low level stress because again, it's just six rounds of one minute. And the um, the idea of the game is so abstracted that you don't even need to worry about like theme pulling you in, like, you know, oh, maybe people are gonna die or something like that. You're just trying to get points and you're trying to do it better than the people around the table. And I found that every time I played this game, uh, the just the general ambiance of voices and words and things that people are saying is just fun to hear as people are kind of struggling to make these things work, uh, kind of chiding themselves and trying to uh, build this thing up in front of themselves. So yeah, this one has uh, pretty much always been a hit when I've seen it played, and I think that it would work really well for people coming into the hobby. Next on the list, we have the newest game we'll be talking about today, which is Iquazu, which came out in 2017. Now, the idea of this game is you are trying to hide your gems behind a waterfall. And from a visual perspective, this is a really cool looking game. You put it in the middle of the table and you have all of these rows and columns. And the majority of the columns are hidden by these water tiles. And as the game goes on, there's this large lizard uh, cardboard piece that kind of slides across the waterfall, opening up new locations to put your gems in. And from an abstracted perspective, all you're really doing in this game is drawing cards into your hand and then spending those cards to lodge these gems into the different rows and columns on the waterfall. And whenever a column is completed with the different tokens, then you will do a scoring and you'll just see who has the most tokens in that specific uh, column and they'll get some points. And then you're going to also score every single row when you score the columns. So that means that you can put the gems really far out and not necessarily into the column that's gonna score next because what you're looking for is you get points for the columns, but you get bonus tokens for the rows. 
And so this extra level of trying to do some area majority within rows and columns and trying to keep up with the tempo of the game means that uh, from a rules perspective, the game is incredibly simple. But what you're trying to think about um, on this turn and in the future is a really satisfying situation. And I think that uh, for people coming into the hobby, this would be a great way to be introduced to the idea of area majorities, as well as the idea of um, just what are you trying to do uh, on this turn, like tactical thinking with hand management, but also what are you going to want to do multiple turns out and how are you going to want to um, uh, compete in some of those competitions many turns out by putting those gems really far out onto the waterfall area. Uh, I think that graphically this game looks really great out on the table, so I think that's going to definitely pull people in. But like I said, just the simplicity of the gameplay uh, going into the decisions that you're making and also the re reward you feel as you evaluate all of these columns and the rows and you get all these tokens and this and that, you really feel like you're being um, uh, rewarded for the good decisions that you've made, whether or not those were actually good decisions for yourself or maybe your opponents just didn't play off you as well as they maybe could have. So uh, in general, uh, this game really impressed me and I think that it would work very well for people coming into the hobby. Moving on, we now have the oldest game that I'll be talking about today, and that is Can't Stop, which came out in 1980. Now, this is a push-your-luck style game with a very simple rule set. All you do on your turn is you roll four dice, and then you need to split those four dice into two pairs. And they're just regular D6s, and you sum up those two dice, and then you have this big board in the middle of the table that looks like a stop sign. And on it, you have all of the columns that go from 2 to 12, which are the possible um, numbers that you can get by adding two regular D6 dice. And you are going to put these little temporary markers out there, and then you can roll the dice again. And if you hit another number that you've already done on this turn, you can move your temporary marker up. And you are going to keep going until until you either choose to stop, or if you can't stop, which is the name of the game, then you're going to keep rolling until you bust, which means there's no combination of those two, those four dice that will give you numbers that you've already done earlier in that given turn, and then you lose all of your progress, and then the next person takes their turn. And this is a very simple game. You keep playing until one person um, hits their marker up to the very top of the level, their permanent marker, because when you stop, you replace the temporary ones with your permanent ones. And you're just going to keep going until somebody gets there. And the fun from this game comes from the atmosphere that is generated. Like, the rules are so simple, but when it's your turn, you have this wonderful stress of, like, do I keep going? Do I not? You always have this just one more roll type of feeling. And then when it's not your turn, even though you're not actually actively making decisions, you are just, like, heckling the person. You're, like, you're trying to tell them, be like, roll again. Of course, you'll be fine. You know, you want them to bust. And then when they roll and they somehow hit it, then you could, like, groan. Or if they bust, then everybody cheers, and you pass the dice around. So you need to make sure that you are okay with everybody cheering at your failure, but you also know that if that happens, then you are about to be cheering on about other people's failure as well. And so I just love the atmosphere that this game brings to the table, and especially if people are not familiar with modern board gaming, and I know this game is like almost 30 years old, but I'm still going to lump it in together, that if people are not familiar with it, there's often a uh, feeling that uh, board gaming is kind of a dry, quiet affair, and this one definitely upends that, and uh, I r really enjoy this game. I haven't played it that much recently, but my copy is from the early 80s, and I have actually been playing this game since I was a child. Like, uh, I have no idea what exact age I was, but probably like seven or eight the first time I actually played this one, and that's still the copy uh, in its, all its faded glory in my collection. So this one, I think, is a really solid game. Okay, the next game we'll be talking about is Ascension. Now, this game came out in 2010, and I think it brings a couple really interesting things to the table when it comes to modern board gaming and kind of opening people's eyes to some of the interesting, cool things that it does. Now, uh, from Ascension's perspective, this is one of the first deck building games. And deck building, again, is the idea where you have a really basic deck that's the same as everybody else's. And as you play the game, you're going to get new cards to put into that deck, shuffle it up, and then play those repeatedly as the deck gets bigger and you get deeper into the game and hopefully these cards are going to combo with each other and do some really cool satisfying things and now while this is of course deck building in a nutshell it's also a engine building style thing you know the idea that this thing is an engine and you're kind of feeding things into it and you hope it's not a clunky engine you really want it to run smooth and spew out a whole bunch of currency so that you can get really high victory point stuff back into that deck and I think that this is a a really cool idea if you kind of step back and um, if you're familiar with deck building games you step back and try to consider a world without deck building like 
it's a very interesting idea, especially for people who maybe are only familiar with classical style board and card games. Like you're really just building this thing in front of you, this like little beautiful little sandcastle that's gonna be different every single time you play based off of the shuffle of that deck. And that I believe is gonna be a very novel experience. And also I think that the decisions that you're making as you are playing through the game can be very satisfying. And also you will feel the ramifications of your bad decisions and your good decisions and feel ownership of those as you're actually playing through the game. So I think for all these reasons, Ascension makes for a really good gateway experience. All right, let's keep working down the list. And for the next one, I have a two for one because this is Codenames and Codenames Pictures, which came out in 2015 and 2016 respectively. And they're effectively the same game, just in one you have these clue cards with words on them, and in the other one you have clue cards with images. And this is a team-based game where you put these clue cards into a grid in the middle of the table, and each team has a single clue giver, and they try to give these clues to their team so they can figure out which cards are theirs before the opposing team figures out which are all of their cards. And so this game does a lot of really good things from a gateway perspective. The first is that it incorporates a wide variety of um, uh, player counts. Like it plays uh, six very well. It also plays 10 players very well. And I have noticed that um, sometimes when people are getting into the hobby and coming to game nights for the first time, they have an inclination to try and play bigger games where everybody's playing the same thing at the same time as opposed to splitting off into smaller groups. And Codenames does that very well. Also, you have the ability for people to collaborate with each other. As, as long as they're not the clue giver, if they are on the rest of the team, they can discuss what the options are and try to figure out what um, they should really um, go with, with as far as the uh, clues that they're doing and what order they should do. And um, that whole experience um, gives it a cooperative feel while also being competitive because you want to beat the other half of the people on the table. So these are uh, just a few of the reasons why I think Codenames works so well as being a gateway experience. Also, from a rules perspective, as long as the clues giver uh, clue givers know the rules, pretty much everyone else, you don't even really need to teach the game. You just set it up and you start playing. So it has a very low uh, barrier to entry when it comes to rules, and the uh, gameplay experience seems to have uh, gone off very well every time I've seen it played. Next up, we have Patchwork, which came out in 2014, and this is a two-player only game where you're trying to build the uh, best quilt, or at least one that can beat out your opponents. And from a mechanics perspective, this game does a couple really interesting modern type of board game things while also having a relatively low amount of rules overhead. Because what you are doing on each turn is drafting these uh, really funky shaped uh, puzzle pieces and you're putting them into your quilt in front of you. But in order to grab those pieces, you have to spend a currency which is buttons, but also a currency which is time. And you only take your turn when you are farthest back on this essential uh, time spiral in the middle of the table. So if you spend too much time, then you might give your opponent several turns. And this is a pretty neat idea the first time you run into it, and it works out very well, and it also has a little bit of engine building in the game, because the pieces themselves are going to generate buttons, which are a resource that you use to buy more pieces. So it has that kind of escalating feel of, um, you know, playing off the good decisions that you made previously in the game. And also, since it's a two-player only experience, it usually runs relatively quickly, because it's just you and the other opponent trying to go head-to-head -head with this quilt-making experience. And this one has gone over very well with pretty much everyone I've seen uh, play it, and I think it's just a uh, combination of the interesting and low overhead rules, as well as a satisfying experience, kind of nestling all of these little puzzle pieces together. Okay, let's keep moving down the list, and for this next game, we have Stone Age. Now, this came out in 2008, and it is a worker placement style game that does a whole bunch of things right. And I think from a rules overhead perspective, you can get into this one relatively quickly, but it has quite a bit of strategic depth, especially for people who are just now approaching the uh, modern board gaming hobby. Now, uh, the reason for this is because you have this pool of workers, and on every single round, you need to kind of plan out how you're going to be using these workers. You know, you only have so many of them, and you can actually get more workers by going to a specific spot on the board, or maybe you need to go over here to get some wood, over there to get some brick, and then over here so you can use the wood and the brick in order to build that building, and then go over there to grab that development card, and all of these things are uh, potentially blockable by your opponents, because if they go onto those spots, then it's going to be harder for you to get gain access to those locations, depending on which spots they are on the board. And I think from a worker placement uh, perspective, this is probably one of the best games to actually learn this style. And I think that there are a lot of great things that you can think about while you're playing the game. Uh, in addition to the fact that 
This is a worker placement game where you can actually spend multiple workers with an action. Uh, many of this style of game, it's always just one worker, one worker, one worker. But here, you need to think, like, do I send three or four workers over into that area to gather wood, for instance, on this turn? And how many workers do I have left, and what can I do with those different things? And activating all of those uh, great decisions is just a big part of why this uh, game has had some really good staying power throughout the years, and why I really enjoyed playing this one a bunch. Uh, this was one of my gateway games. I think it was the second game I uh, really got into when I was uh, getting into modern board gaming, and I must have played this one 30 or 40 times way back then. So I can tell you from personal experience that this is an excellent ga uh, gateway uh, gaming experience, and I'm not sure how easy it is to acquire these days, but it should still definitely be out there, and you should totally give it a try if you haven't. Let's now move on to what is likely the most well-known game of this list, which is Settlers of Catan. Now, this game came out in 1995, and I suppose recently it's just called Catan these days. But uh, from a personal perspective, this was my gateway game. I had no experience with anything modern board gaming, and then 10 years ago, back in 2008, I met some new friends who loved Settlers of Catan, and they taught me the game, and we proceeded to play it almost weekly for well over a year. And I have everything, all of this to thank for Settlers of Catan because uh, this is the reason, uh, this game is the reason I found Board Game Geek and I found so many other games and kind of really fell into loving this hobby. And so let's talk about the game itself, I suppose. So what you're doing in this game is you have an island in the middle of the table and you have a handful of resource cards and you're gonna spend those cards to build out roads and settlements and cities. And those settlements and cities are gonna generate you more resources based off of a die roll. You're gonna roll these two dice between every single turn, and then everybody who is adjacent to the specific spots uh, based off the die are going to generate those resources. So this game does a whole bunch of really good things from a gateway perspective. The first is you get stuff when it's not your turn, you get resources when it's not your turn, uh, but also you get to interact when it's not your turn because a big part of this game is trading and negotiation. You have cards in your hand and you don't necessarily need to use all of them, and your opponent might desperately need this one type of card. So now you're going to negotiate trading this card or that card back and forth with them, but maybe they're also trying to make a deal with this person over there. So now you're trying to make a better deal than that person to try and make this thing happen so that you can build the stuff that you really need to down in front of you. Also, the game has a great mechanic where whenever a seven is rolled on this pair of dice, then anybody who is hoarding too many cards is going to lose a whole bunch of cards. So you are very much motivated to try and stay under the card threshold, which means you might find yourself doing trades just to not have so many cards in your hand, but have the correct cards in your hand by the time it actually comes back around to you. Uh, so this game has a very low uh, rules uh, threshold. You can really get into it relatively quickly. It's very, very interactive, and if you enjoy getting in each other's way and really like squeezing the last bit of uh, trading oomph you can out of specific things, then this one's definitely going to appeal to people. Um, but also, I think that the variance of the dice uh, somewhat levels the playing field. It does mean that you will have plays where you just feel like you just could not catch a break, and you're like, I lost because of the dice. And that can happen, but I suppose any game with uh, where you have a roll, you roll dice and see what happens because of it uh, could have that potentially happen. And I think the trading amount in the game uh, levels that down to a very uh, reasonable amount. And while I have not actually played this game in many years at this point, I can say that it was played to death for me. Uh, I suppose death implies I'll never play it again, but I think I am kind of over it at this point because it was played so much as I got into the hobby. And that's realistically what gateway games are all about. All right, at this point, we've reached game number two, and that is going to be Concept. Now, this one came out in 2013, and it is more of an activity than a game, if I'm being totally honest with you, because what you have is a large board in the middle of the table, and it is covered in a variety of little descriptor boxes of a wide variety of different things. You might have uh, an area that's just colors, you have an area that's shapes, you have an area that might be like professions and uh, temperatures and, you know, just a, an incredible number of different icons on the board. And what you're doing is you have one person who has a clue that they're trying to get out to the people around the table, and all they can do is put cubes down on the board. And the cubes can match colors to little question marks, so you can make an idea. Like you say, you put a red question mark down onto this one spot, and then the spot is a box. And then maybe you put a little cube down onto the brown spot. And so people say, oh, so it's a brown box. And then you do another thing over here and try to um, integrate all of these different concepts together to get to the ultimate goal. 
and the game itself has rules in it and victory points, and you should never ever play with those. Realistically, the best way this game is played is you just put it uh, the board in the middle of the table, and you just have people start um, going for it. Like, like have one person trying to give clues. We've found also that it oftentimes makes sense to have two people giving a clue together, and I think that the official rules has you doing that, but since we've never really played with the official rules, I can't speak to that uh, very well. But I can say that this one seems to get along great with pretty much everyone who's tried it, and this is another game that plays pretty much any player count. Like I mentioned with uh, Codenames earlier, I've seen Codenames work, I've seen Concept work with four people, and I've seen it work with 10 or 11 people, and you just kind of go until you're ready to do something else. Uh, for quite a while, it was played um, somewhat often at the end of board game nights as kind of a way to ease ourselves out of it. But I have also uh, taught this game to uh, many people who have um, been just getting into the hobby, and it's been wonderful to see how engaged people can get with it. Now, I will mention that I have seen one or two, two people just not get it. They just don't figure it out, and I suppose that can happen with most games. But uh, the reason this game is so high up on the list, again, is because you can just get it out and just start playing. As long as one person understands the rules and they um, are the first person to actually do a concept out on the board, you'll see all these little lights turn on in people's heads as they kind of grasp it, and in general, have a really good time playing it. Okay, we finally reached my number one gateway game, and that one's going to be Colorado. Now, this game came out in 2003, and at first, it doesn't look like much. It's just a little deck of cards in this small box, and all you do on your turn is you either draw a card and then add it onto one of the face-up piles in the middle of the table, or you take one of the piles in the middle of the table. That's essentially the whole game. So from a rules overhead perspective, it is a very easy game to get into, and it does play two to five players, so it's somewhat flexible in that respect. But the reason this game works so well is because you have a wonderful tension when it comes to the scoring. Because what you're trying to do is get sets of the different colored geckos, but you're only going to score positive points for three of those sets. And so that means for any um, other colored geckos that you have outside of three, they're going to give you negative points for that set again. And the more of uh, that color that you have, the more points you're going to have. And of course, if you go really wide, then you're going to get more and more negative points for that fourth or fifth color that you have in front of you. So what you're trying to do in this game is figure out the right moment to grab the cards from the middle of the table, and you need to decide, is this the moment or maybe not? And I'll draw a card, and maybe this card's great for you. So you want to try and put it on a pile that you don't think anybody else is going to take, but they can see what you want, and so they might take it just to kind of mess you over. And every single round, there's going to be one pile per player in the middle of the table, as long as you're not playing with the two-player variant, that is. Which means that as you kind of build these piles out, um, invariably, somebody's probably going to get something they want, and uh, somebody's probably going to get a pile they really don't want within that given round, and then you just add more cards and you just go round around around until you get through that whole deck. And in general, it seems like this game plays in like 15 to 20 minutes or so, and from a gateway perspective, this was not a gateway game for me, but I have taught this game to probably six to eight people that have essentially no experience with modern board gaming. Uh, I kept it in my work backpack for quite a while, actually, and I would teach it to some of my coworkers when we had a break at work. And I would always say, you know, this little deck of cards is going to get you guys yelling at each other in about 10 minutes. And they would look at me incredulously, and then we start playing, and then sure enough, it would happen, because the way you draw those cards and the way you pick to put them down the piles, you're going to put them down in such a way to really try and make things hard for your opponents. And it's been wonderful to see this game come alive pretty much every single time i played it. Like, it seems like people just enjoy the decisions that come into play here, as long as you don't mind a little bit of conflict back and forth between everybody. And just the amount of game and uh, enjoyment that has come out of this small little box um, has been really surprising to me. And this is part of the reason why I actually uh, bought the 10-year uh, anniversary version with nicer artwork. Uh, but there are a couple different versions of this game that I think you can go ahead and acquire. But uh, for this one, I think for its size and its um, complexity level to the overall rulesness, it uh, really deserves the top spot on my list of gateway games. Well, with that, it looks like we have now reached the end of this list, and I hope that you found this one interesting, as well as the previous three that I did earlier on in this month. Uh, again, all of these were made to help support the pledge drive that is happening right now and the uh, Patreon campaign that is really kind of boosting the ability for me to make these videos professionally uh, well into the future from a financial perspective, uh, because obviously I'm spending just a ton of time uh, working on them. So uh, if you would like to support the channel and support all the stuff that I'm doing, uh, please consider going to patreon.com slash John Games and checking out all the variety of different uh, things that are over there. 
Speaking of Patreon, as always, I'd like to thank all of these producer-level pledges, as well as everyone else who has been supporting this channel through the years. Now, if you'd like to see more uh, vlog-style content like this one, as well as the in-depth board game reviews that I do, and the full game playthroughs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.